Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 268 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new movie, The Dark Tower, based on a series of novels by Stephen King. And this will involve spoilers for The Dark Tower movie, and may also include spoilers for the books as well, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and he also oversees John Joseph Adams' books, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. He's the series editor of The Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, and he's also edited many other anthologies, including the recent books Cosmic Powers, Dead Man's Hand, and Other Worlds Than These. So John, welcome back. Uh, good to be here. I'm looking forward to this palaver. <laughs> then next up, we've got Rajan Khanna making his eighth appearance on the show. He's the author of the post-apocalyptic novels Falling Sky and Rising Tide, and his articles have appeared on Tor.com and LitReactor.com. His Weird West stories Card Sharp and Second Hand appear in John's anthologies The Way of the Wizard and Dead Men's Hand, and his latest novel Raining Fire is out now. So Raj, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. And also joining us today is Maya Prohovnik. She's the head of operations at Anchor, creators of the Anchor app, which bills itself as the easiest way to make a podcast from your phone. She's also the creator of the website The Dairy Connection, which attempts to list out all of the connections ever found between books in the Stephen King universe. So Maya, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and so Maya, since you're joining us for the first time, let's start with you and have you just tell us about how you got to be such a big Stephen King fan. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been reading Stephen King books since I was really little. I think in maybe middle school I started and I didn't become a Stephen King super fan until I read The Dark Tower, actually. Um, and I feel like that was when I started noticing all the connections between the books. Um, and I think that's when I went from fandom to obsession. Uh, and so I, uh, I started keeping track in a spreadsheet. Like for years, I was just writing down connections that I found and I ended up uh, turning them into a website because I wanted to keep track of all of them because I am crazy. So when when how old were you when you read Dark Tower? I read it I think it was like 2011, 2012, so it was like what is that? 5 or 6 years ago, so 20s. Uh-huh. And so when we met, you told me that your husband actually proposed to you outside Stephen <laughs> King's house? <laughs> he did, yeah. Is there anything, I don't know, is there a funny story? Any anything more to say about that? Uh the the only funny story is I we went to Maine to visit Stephen King's house. Like we did the Stephen King tour in Bangor and all that stuff. And I specifically said, Don't propose to me in front of Stephen King's house because I didn't <laughs> want to be embarrassed. Uh and he did it anyway. And so I when he got down on one knee, I just started yelling at him uh, and didn't didn't say yes until we walked away. Uh, <laughs> look looking back on it, it was romantic. Uh, what are the other stops on the Stephen King tour? Oh my God, there's so many. You see the um the the water tower from it. You see uh, actually the store that Randall Flag was named after. It says like our flag on it. Um, you see the cemetery where Stephen King used to walk all the time that in, that inspired Pet Cemetery. Um, you see all the places he lived. So there's one in particular. There's this old house that he used to live in that is exactly like one of the scenes in Insomnia. So it's like mm. you can picture the whole thing. We saw the airport where the Langoliers takes place. Like there, it's just so much stuff. Do they take you by the road where he got hit by the car, which actually ends up in the Dark Tower, basically? They don't. I actually don't think that was there. Oh, okay. Oh, it was in some other place. I think so, yeah. I see, right. And so then how did you go about turning your spreadsheet into the Dairy Connection website? Uh, it's, it's pretty bad actually. Like I, I think it, I just sort of put how my brain works onto a website. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's a full list of all the books and you can click through to any book and see all the places that it's referred to or all the other books that, that it refers to in the book. Um, and then you can click through to any like person or place or thing and see all the places that it's mentioned. Um, and I've also started keeping track of like softer themes between Stephen King's books. So, uh, things that are sort of hard to pin down, but I've noticed, for example, he, there's specific words that he uses a lot so I started tracking that too and I like mm. have charts about like when he started saying insouciant because he suddenly <laughs> says that a lot um so just like things like that I, I am tracking for no good reason and are those all things that you noticed or do people like do readers submit things for your website Definitely both. So when I started putting it together, I actually like did a bunch of bunch of research and I like cataloged stuff that people had already noticed. And then since then, I've just been every time I read a Stephen King book, I note all the things that I find. Um, and I, I do have a submission form. So anyone who comes across something, I would love more submissions because it's a lot of work uh, reading every Stephen King book over and over again. 
Yeah, and so that website, it's, again, it's called The Dairy Connection. So everyone go check it out. Thank and you. so obviously, Dark Tower is uh, really important to you. And so what did you think yes. of this new Dark Tower movie? Oh, I thought it was horrible. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> uh, well, so uh, yeah. why did you think it was terrible? I Well, I should say I, I didn't – I had really low expectations, so I feel like it wasn't the worst movie I've ever seen, and it certainly wasn't the worst Stephen King movie I've ever seen. Uh, but I just felt so disappointed. Like, I was so ready to be – you know, to have that magical moment of like, I'm, I'm watching the dark tower happen on the big screen. And it just felt like some other bad movie. Uh, like I felt like the characters weren't very true to life. It felt like my biggest issue is there were so many opportunities to have connections to other Stephen King things. And it's like, they did the, okay, here's Christine, here's Pennywise and that's it. Um, so I just felt a little gypped, I think. Yeah. How about John? what do you think of this movie? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I think that those who made this movie have forgotten the faces of their fathers, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, I mean, no, I hated it. I mean, I, I was I was getting actually, like, angry as I was watching mm -hmm. it, like, as it went on. I mean, I think it's inept in so many different ways. Um, I mean, I think it's easy to cast a lot of the blame on the director, but... Um, on the other hand, my primary suspect for why this sucks is because of Akiva Goldman. Um, like, and actually, as I was uh, preparing for the panel, I happened to see that uh, the AV Club has an article all about it. Uh, like, and it's and it basically has my thoughts down on the page. But it's like the title of the article is "From Dark Tower to Batman and Robin: Crappy Blockbusters Share One Guilty Party." And guess who it is? It's Akiva Goldman. If I had known that he was involved with it, I would have had much lower expectations. I would have been just like, "Oh, well, that's des that's doomed," you know. But I mean, like, honestly, like. The guy who wrote Batman and Robin, the fact that he ever got work again after that is ridiculous, especially like getting any other genre work. It's like he clearly doesn't understand genre whatsoever. Every genre thing that he's been associated with has been fucking terrible. Like he, he wrote Lost in Space, the, you know, the movie adaptation. He wrote Batman and Robin. He wrote the iRobot, uh, Will Smith movie, uh, the Da Vinci Code adaptation, I Am Legend. They're just all terrible. Mm. Um, and, uh, oh, and he also wrote and directed the adaptation of Winter's Tale based on the Mark Helprin novel, which I haven't seen because I saw his vile taint on it. And so I just, <laughs> but, then, but then everybody else like hated it and thought it was like a, an abomination. So I was like, okay, well, I, I was right. Um, you know, and, uh, so anyway, I don't want to keep ranting about Akiva Goldman, but, um, you know, like, I don't know if he's he's the worst writer to ever win a, a writing Oscar. But, you know, if you're having that conversation, you at least got to mention him. Well, so actually, for, let, let me add, yeah. John. So he also was involved with writing Insurgent, which is 28 percent on Rotten Tomatoes and mm. The Fifth Wave, which is 16 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Right. And yeah, I haven't seen either of those. Yeah. And, and I mean, I I hate to blame like there's so many people involved with the movie that mm. you don't know who's to blame for what. And often the writers have the least amount of say over how the thing actually turns out. And mm -hmm. so I don't want to say Akiva Goldsman for sure is the culprit, but he does seem to always be at the scene of the crime. You know? <laughs> right, right. You know, I don't know either, but he's my primary suspect, is, yeah. is what I'm saying. Uh, and, and I mean, the I think the director definitely bears a lot of the blame, uh, Nicola Arkel, um, and or Nicola Arkel. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, just because like so, like I said, like so much of it is inept. Like, I mean, even just watching it as a movie without like the, my attachment to the Dark Tower, um, so much of it is just like subpar and like, I don't understand why they made these choices. Um, I mean, there, there, there are moments where like I was pleased, you know, by, by a scene or, or sort of a moment in a scene, but just like overall, it was just so disappointing. All right. How about Raj? what do you think of this movie? Well, as a third member of this quartet, I too <laughs> was very, uh, disappointed and at times angry, um, because of this movie. And, you know, if you recall those, I guess, animal creatures in the movie that wear the skins of humans, mm -hmm. I felt like this was a generic action movie, a poor generic action movie wearing the skin of the Dark Tower. Oh, so there was that's a good, good one. There was yeah. nothing that felt true to the books that I had read. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like it failed if you if you love the books. And if you hadn't read the books, I mean, this is just, again, extrapolation, but I feel like if you hadn't read the books, they didn't give you enough to really feel connected to anything I, I would imagine you know you get little bits and pieces of you know the the background of the gunslinger um and things like that but it it just was so generic and glossed over and um yeah i i, I was just angry because it failed as a dark tower movie but it was just a terrible movie in general i thought 
Well, let me say, Raj, because I've only read the first book in the series, The Gunslinger. So I was coming to this fairly fresh. And mm -hmm. so it opens and there's the sort of creepy suburbs with the kids playing chess and hopscotch and braiding each other's hair or whatever they were doing. And then there's the creepy um, air raid siren thing, and they all start gathering in front of the giant black ziggurat. And then you see that this whole thing is up on this big mesa or whatever with steep cliffs on all the sides so they can't escape. And I was like, okay, I'm on board. This is pretty cool so far. And then we jump to Jake Chambers, and I essentially lost interest immediately because every scene felt super fast and it was like cutting so quickly from thing to thing. And it was all super stereotypical stuff with his like step, like um, stepdad and mm -hmm. bullies. And uh, it just started, it stops feeling like a feature film. Even to me, it felt like a, like a made for TV movie or a, like mm -hmm. a TV show or something. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so it lost me pretty much after, you know, four minutes or something. Did you, David, do you feel like you have any idea what the Dark Tower is about after watching it? <laughs> well, it's interesting because a lot of the commentary I've seen has has said you wouldn't be able to understand this if you haven't read the yeah. books. I, 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 I thought it was like incredibly stupidly obvious what was happening. I mean, there, there, are, <laughs> there were completely inexplicable things like he gets attacked by the tornado of two by fours. Yeah. Um, like that made no sense whatsoever <laughs> to me, but I thought like, I thought the movie was so familiar that I had no trouble understanding what was going on ever. I mean, I, I felt like if you just took every sci-fi adventure movie starring a kid and put mm -hmm. them in a blender and just blended it up and poured it out into a cup, yeah. this is kind of what it would be. It's the most average movie of this type I've ever seen. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess my concern is like, you understood the movie, but I feel like you understand so little about the dark tower like, it oversimplifies the whole plot so much in such a bad way. Well, yeah, I no, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean uh, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I will say that one of the, uh, the, the, the scene where um, Idris Elba, I, mean, I may be getting a little bit ahead, but the, the scene where Idris Elba um, draws the little circle in the sand and has mm -hmm. the spider walking in to explain how the Dark Tower is holding the forces of darkness at bay, I thought was actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I did get that. Um, mm -hmm. at, at, at least. Yeah, you know, I mean, one thing, one thing that I thought was kind of uh, one of its big sins to me, like as sort of a as a genre sort of expert, and you know, I've I've dealt a lot, I've thought a lot about weird westerns and stuff, and like the fact that the Dark Tower is like this sort of preeminent example of the weird western. It's like you would never know that from watching this movie, and it's yeah. like how the he like how is that possible? Like, I mean, the I mean, the thought process that went into like how the fuck do you not begin the movie with you know, the man in black fled across the desert uh, yep. and the gunslinger followed. You know, it's like, how do you not begin it like that? Well, like, did you, you know? <laughs> did you guys see, there was an interview with Stephen King that came out like the day before it, it got released. And he, you know, they were like, what do you think of the movie? And he was very nicely, but very clearly sort of like, well, you know, they didn't want my advice on any of this stuff. So he was like, it, they didn't want to include that line at all. And he told them how important it was to fans and mm -hmm. it was down to every detail. So he was like, you know, Roland should really have a cowboy hat. And they were like, Oh, people don't like Westerns with cowboy hats. So they just left it out. Like Ugh. tiny things like that, that it's like, you're ruining everything about the characters. And he wow. tried. But in, on that level, I mean, I feel like w what drew me. And again, I've been on this show before talking about my love for weird Westerns, but what I love about these books, or at least one part of what I love about these books, is this world that he created mm -hmm. with Gilead and, you know, this kind of feudal society, but it's, it's a, a gunslinging society and it's, it's this really cool, unique thing. And, you know, they barely touch on that. Like yeah. we get, we get the stuff where he's good with a gun and he's, you know, his guns are made from King Arthur's sword, basically. But it's almost like they just picked out a few couple things and threw it in there. And we're like, that's good enough, right? Well, that, um, that, let me just say, Raj, that line in particular was so bizarrely out of place where right, um, yeah. Matthew McConaughey just says, oh, and his guns were made from yeah. like whatever the <laughs> yeah. thing is, which on uh, Keystone <laughs> Earth they would call Excalibur. It's like, who, right. so who are you talking so to? Right. I also <laughs> felt like like it was almost like whoever wrote it or directed it or whatever it was given an outline and said like here are the characters mm -hmm. and here's a few interesting things about this story and they were like okay that's all I need and they went from there so it was like that was one fact on their sheet they're like ah oh, we should toss that in there because that's fun um but my while I'm speaking I'm I'm going to just go on to my other problem one of my many other problems which is there is no character development for anyone like mm -hmm. even if you can admit that like Jake 
could be the main character of this movie, you know, we get introduced to him and I was like, I don't have any idea who this kid is. They kind of, you know, he has bad dreams and he kind of is bullied, but he's the first person to punch that kid in the face. And, you know, we're, we're, we're depending on these tropes that are basically like the kid who's, you know, persecuted, but really is, you know, knows what he's talking about. But there's nothing about Jake in the beginning that makes him likable at all or interesting or except for the dreams. Um, and I feel like it's all plot devices throughout. There's nothing about Roland actually that seems compelling, which is really, you know, like it, unlike the books, he's not, he's not interested in the dark tower at all. He doesn't even want to go there. He's like out for revenge. And, you know, the man in black has no real, you know, why does he want to destroy the dark tower? Why does he just like screw with people? Sure. He's like the devil. He's a force of evil, but like, there's nothing to any of these characters that makes any of them interesting to me right off the bat. Can I just ask you, Raj, the whole thing with Jake as our like um sur um our surrogate into this story is that from the book Jake is in the books but i mean there's other characters as well i mean there's Eddie and there's um i mean the i i don't Dana. know which sorry yeah right who's also Odetta and Detta right. yeah. <laughs> so um and i think you know Jake was special um and Jake has a i mean i don't know how much we're going into the the storyline and you guys probably you know John and Maya know this better than i i've read four of the books but um, you know, he's not the main character. He's one of mm -hmm. several characters, I think. Um, you know, I was wondering if, if he became the main character because they were trying to appeal to a younger audience or the hip YA market or whatever it was. Um, but I felt like, I don't know, I, I wanted to see a cool Roland at the very least. And yeah. I love Idris Elba and, you know, I love the casting. So it was really, I don't know. I felt like he was a supporting character in his own mm -hmm. movie, you know. Totally. Yeah, no, and I mean, I think, I think that's one of the big uh, things that's really bothersome about it uh, as a fan of the Dark Tower. But then also just if you look at the, uh, you look at it from, uh, from the outside, it's like, okay, so it's great that they, they cast an African-American person as Roland. Like, I, I fully support that. And like, I, and I love uh, Idris Elba also. But then they, they made him not the main character. Yeah. Right. So they, so they basically, they basically took somebody who's supposed to be the main character of the movie. They made him a sidekick to the white kid. Mm -hmm. So they basically pushed Roland's character into the mag magical Negro archetype. Exactly. Which is like, what the fuck? Like, uh, I mean, it's like you did this. He's like, okay, good. Like you, 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 you cast someone regardless of their race and everything. And so like you did that well, but then you went and you completely subverted the, you know, any positive thing that you achieved by doing that. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just so aggravating from so many different um, angles that I just, I, I don't understand. Like, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like no thought went into any of these kinds of issues. See, Maya, as, as the expert here, could you, could you give me a little bit more context of how the presentation of Jake Chambers differs from the book series? Yeah, well, so it's interesting because I, you guys all know this because you read the first book, but the first book... I think Jake doesn't really become a major player until the third book, right? Because mm -hmm. in the first book, you get the background on the gunslinger. In the second book is when he draws in Eddie and Susanna. And then Jake doesn't really show up for real until the third book. And so I think I've heard some theories that like, we're talking spoilers are okay, right? Yeah, yeah. And you guys know what happens at the end of Dark Tower? The... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, the speculation is that this was a, actually a sequel. And so this is a different right. version. And so the point at which you're entering the movie story is after the events of the books have happened. And so it sort of skips past the whole thing where like Jake, um, dies in real life, gets dropped off the cliff by Roland. He says his famous, famous line. And like, that's the speculation why they didn't bother doing any of that stuff. Um, but I still think even in the third book, it's like Jake there's a few chapters from his perspective, but it's just to get him in front of Roland and then it goes back into the main story. So I agree. I found it really weird that he was the main character because even in the books, he's a little flat. Like he just kind of, he exists to be something that Roland kind of bounces his own personality and issues off of. He's never really like a character with a lot of uh, exposition. What's the story with the two by four tornado? I had no yeah, idea so what the, was going on there. In, in the books, it makes a lot more sense. There, so the that that house, the Dutch Hill Mansion, uh, he goes in there and he basically the house is a demon that's protecting him from going through the portal, or that's you know protecting the portal. Um, and so he gets in a whole fight with the house, and it is understood that like the house comes to life and all this crazy cool stuff happens. Uh, it was really weird that he just got sucked in and got a splinter and then went through the portal. It didn't mm -hmm. make any sense. 
Uh, I was I was going to say about the um the speculation that that the movie is actually a sequel to the book series, you yeah. know, because of the because the cycle continues and all that. I mean, you know what's bizarre about that is that it literally says that the that the director confirmed that right on the IMDb page. Yeah. So it's not even it's not even like theory and just out there is like oh well maybe this maybe this and like what are you why are you even saying that like before anyone yeah. can even see the movie <laughs> right. like like shouldn't he shouldn't he be played that coy like i mean yeah um, that's sort of I the mean, whole even, point yeah right and so but like even with that understanding and like of course i knew that that was a possibility going into the movie because i have read the books but um it's like it, it doesn't it doesn't forgive the movie's sins as an adaptation at either no because because it's all about the feel of it it's about it's you know it doesn't feel like the dark tower mm -hmm. um even if it is the the next cycle or whatever you know so it's like it, it yeah it's just uh it's just yeah i don't know it's a lot of weird questionable decisions i i don't necessarily disagree with the decision to try to make it like the second or, or you know the next yeah. cycle from what we had already read but i don't know what they were doing with this attempted presentation of it it, it just doesn't make any sense yeah it was really weird. And I that's my biggest complaint, too. I, I said this to everyone after I watched it. Like, it just didn't feel like the world that I was used to. And I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing for me was, like, what was missing was in the Dark Tower, especially in the first couple books, you're, everyone sort of feels unsettled and crazy because they're, like, both, all of them are seeing kind of multiple dimensions and they're all confused. And there's this, like, everywhere you look, something is a little off or something is repetitive. or And there was, like, one moment like that in the movie where all the people on the street were looking at Jake. But that was the only time that they mm -hmm. really did that. And I really mm -hmm. felt like that was such a like even if the rest of the movie sucked that would have been such an easy like ambient thing to do is just make everyone feel like subtly uncomfortable the whole time like people are watching them and weird stuff is happening like why was everything not the number 19 like it's so mm -hmm. easy to do mm -hmm. that um so yeah right. that was that was my biggest complaint too okay can i just ask you guys about one other character is um matthew mcconaughey who plays walter mm -hmm. the man in black the villain has this like hot henchman and there's just <laughs> one scene where he turns to her and's like oh hey you're really hot. <laughs> and then that's basically her only role in the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And is that character <laughs> in the book? And does she have a purpose in the books? I don't think so. Yeah, I didn't recognize her. He, I, it's possible. I, you know, go ahead. He definitely has henchmen that he sort of abuses, but there's nothing. There's no like, well, maybe there's a hot girl. It sounds vaguely familiar, but it's certainly not anyone who had enough like billing to be in the movie. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, let's get Raj back in here. So, Raj, you said you had a whole uh, laundry list of complaints. So, why don't you give us the next <laughs> next thing on the list? Well, I mean, I mean, the, the two big ones where it doesn't didn't feel like Dark Tower movie. So, there's a, a lot of you know sub topics to that. Um, one of which, like, I think any movie that is science fiction or fantasy based, and they end up coming back to Earth and like doing stuff on Earth. I to me again, this a big squandered opportunity. I mean, they set up that whole like facility. They didn't do much there. Um, you know, one of the things I loved about the first book is that they set up this kind of alternate reality and things are, are weird and different and there's magic. Also, oh, that leads me to one of my big complaints. Some of the battles aside, we, we heard about the, the two by four hurricane, but like that creature that pops out of the red mist in yeah. the forest or whatever. <laughs> terrible and also like you couldn't even make out what it was half the time so i was like uh just some random vague creature creature thing um you know it's just even the sequences that that you know if you're gonna make a generic movie at least make those sequences better yeah. um it, it was just nothing nothing landed anywhere close to the inside of you know my my emotional or you know intellectual Innerscape when in, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Basically, I, I was just watching from afar and just thinking, "Oh my god, um, I wish I was drunk right now or something." <laughs> because you know, it 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 just it was terrible. I went with my girlfriend too, and she hated it, and she never read any of the Dark Tower stuff. But it was just like you know, all those all this stupid stuff you see in the worst possible blockbuster action movies was in this movie, um, well and even. Yeah, go ahead. Well, but I think the thing, though, Raj, is that they sort of, like, presented this as if it was a big-budget summer blockbuster, mm -hmm. which is what you would expect from a Dark Tower, you know, sure. series adaptation. But it only had a budget of $60 million, and I think they just didn't have the budget to do the whole thing in a fantasy landscape. You know, I mean, apparently Ron Howard had wanted to direct this, and he had some other, um, you know, concept for it. And they said it was too expensive at some other studio. And so that's how it ended up at Sony and whatever mm -hmm. 
um, the other thing, it's like M MRC. And so um, setting so much of it on Earth may have just been a necessity because mm -hmm. they didn't have the budget to do a, a real fantasy movie. But honestly, if that's what you're going to do, if you're trying to save money and you're trying to do the whole thing in a non-fantastical way, the whole first book takes place with Roland literally walking through the desert, like almost nothing mm -hmm. magical even happens in the first book. So I think instead of trying to en encapsulate the whole thing in a shitty single movie, they could have just done the first book and it would have been great. I wonder if the reason that they wanted to do it so low budget was because they're used to you know, getting Stephen King movies and producing mm -hmm. them with low budgets. Because if you're going to ever spend all the money, you know, that you can on something, you know, you do it on something like the Dark Tower. Like this could be on the level of like a Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. style epic, you know, I mean, this is this is the one thing I would think of. And I mean, I'm not a King expert and Maya, perhaps you can correct me, but like <laughs> this is his like epic fantasy mm -hmm. series. And this is where you put the budget and you you know, I think it would pay back as long as you had the integrity to produce a, a film series that was, you know, uh, like reflects what the books are about. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I think it's crazy, first of all, that that they even tried to make it as a movie in the first place. It's like I know there was all this talk about a TV show. And, and when I was there still is, research, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. When I was doing research, it seemed like there it is still happening, although. Uh, and, and I guess the movie is doing okay at the box office. It's just that everyone hates it. I'm sure it's <laughs> not going to do well at the box office next week. But, um, you know, I mean, if this new, if the show actually happens, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it seems like it's going to be also terrible if it's any relation to this. But, uh, but I mean, it's like they should have approached this as like Game of Thrones. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, cause like, you know, think about it. It's like, okay, so how many, like, you know, I was, when I was looking it up, it's like, it, it was like, there was like what 1.3 million words of fiction or whatever encompasses like the whole Dark Tower series. So it's like, that's a huge amount of material. And so of course they're not going to, they're not going to incorporate everything into the first movie. But I mean, it's like, so you have 1.3 million words of material to, to represent this world, this, this, this work, but then the movie's only an hour and a half long. Like how terrible was everything that they shot that they had to edit <laughs> it down to 90 minutes. Um, but then also speaking of editing, who is the genius? And I mean this literally like the genius who took the garbage that we saw in that movie and edited <laughs> that brilliant trailer. Oh my the God. Trailer, the trailer is awesome. <laughs> the trailer is the movie I wanted to see. That is not the movie we got. Yep. Like, like the, the genius that it took to actually <laughs> take this pile of shit and find all the little like gems in there and t cut together that trailer. Cause like the trailer actually gave me chills. I'm yeah, not going to lie. Too. Me you know? Too. And so. Yeah, so that makes it feel even more like a betrayal that 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 we were promised this thing in the trailer that felt true to what we would expect as fans of the Dark Tower, and yet the movie was something else completely. Well, and what's so striking too about that, John, is that they had to they obviously had you know like a two and a half hour cut of this movie, and I suspect they showed it to test audiences, and test audiences said it's uh, boring and makes no sense. <laughs> Yeah, and right. so then they said, okay, we have to make it an hour shorter and we have to make it, we have to simplify everything. And that's how we ended up with this, this thing. But then what's so striking about that is how much stuff there still is in it that you could cut out without affecting the story at all. Right. Mm -hmm. Like um, Raj mentioned the stupid um, fake dad mist monster thing. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to complain parenthetically that I'm so like, like every scene in this movie is something that you've seen in 50 other movies before, including that one where yeah. the character wakes up and he's like, wait, I hear my dad's voice. And rather than <laughs> I'm, I'm like in a scary forest on another world and I hear my dad's voice. And rather than waking up the guy next to me and asking him like, you know, maybe what's going on, I'm just going to wander by myself off into <laughs> yeah. the woods. And like, like there's a scene almost exactly like this in space balls of all things. And it's like, <laughs> If you're re reiter you know, regurgitating space balls, like, isn't that a warning sign to you that maybe you should <laughs> rewrite your scenes, you know? <laughs> Can I ask you if, if all of you guys, um, if there was anything that could have happened that could have possibly redeemed it for you or, or at least, I mean, there was one moment in the movie that I was like, oh my God, if they do this thing, I will, they will gain back. <laughs> a certain amount of my goodwill, like not all of it. I wouldn't say this is a great movie, but there was one moment in particular that I was like, oh my God, they're never going to do this. But this would be the moment where I was like, oh, okay, I can go with that. Um, what, what was it? Well, wait, yeah, what's, what's, first Raj, say what yours is. Okay, so if you recall at the end, uh, Jake is in that, that device that's like siphoning off his psychic energy to fire at the Dark Tower. And through the portal, uh, Roland is facing off against the man in black. 
with some guns that don't seem to do anything. And I was, so, so he shoots the man in black, the man in black catches all his bullets. They're having this kind of standoff. And I'm like, well, Jake wants to prevent the dark tower from being destroyed. And Roland has just finally come around to that like belief. Like, wouldn't it be great if he just shot a bullet through the portal and killed Jake and thereby prevented the dark tower from being destroyed. And I was like, I know they're never going to do this because Jake's like the main character, but how great would that have been in that moment when you're like, Oh, this is, this is the future that Jake bought and this is the price that Roland's paying. And I think to me that that was like right there and it obviously didn't go that way. Oh, that is, I love that Raj. That is so good. Oh man. Well, because that's the thing with this movie is that there is literally not a single surprise or plot twist in the entire movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like true. literally everything that happens is like, oh, yeah, that's what I was expecting to happen next. Mm-hmm. Whereas, so mm-hmm. something like that would be like, oh, man, that would have been awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hadn't thought of uh, Raj. I hadn't thought about what Raj is asking, but um, thinking about it for a minute, I, you know, I don't know that it could anything could have possibly saved the movie for me. But um, if it had ended. And like, you know, they triumph and whatever. And then like, and then we somehow get to Roland trekking across the desert, following the man in black again, so that you could actually see that scene that I wanted to see all along. Like that would have redeemed it somewhat, I think. I mean, it's still going to be a pile of shit, but you know, I, I would have at least maybe ended on the sort of a happier note than, than, you know, just being so furious and like yeah. stalking out of the theater as soon as the, as soon as the credits started rolling, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I I think for me, uh, I think what I was picturing the plot of this movie being was the, like, the Jake dying and going back to New York and he and Roland both going insane thing. Like, I think that would have been a cool first movie to kind of show, like, Mm -hmm. the different universes and, like, multiple timelines and that, you know, things aren't always what they seem and there's other worlds than these and all that stuff. Like, that would have been nice. Um, But other than that, for me, like... Literally, I just wanted a movie full of Stephen King references, and that might just be mm-hmm. my own thing, but like, I, I really just feel like you could have squeezed in in 90 minutes a reference to every other book he's ever written in like cute, mm-hmm. subtle ways. And I, I just, I don't understand why they didn't do that. Um, so for me, I kept waiting for like the, the one cool reference that like I would understand that I could be like, okay, like it was worth it sitting here paying attention to this whole movie. Uh, and I just felt like I never really got that. Well, let let me say, like, in in answer to Raj's question, I had a really interesting experience because I watched this movie and it ends. And I'm like, man, was that a piece of shit. (laughs) And then I go to my girlfriend and I say, oh, my God, I saw the movie. It was a total piece of shit. Let me tell you about this total piece of shit movie I just saw. And I describe the whole story to her. And she says, that doesn't actually sound that bad. (laughs) And I realized that, yeah, when I tell it, it actually seems all right. You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's you know, you, you could take this basic plot framework and tell a perfectly satisfying story Mm -hmm. it's just the execution is so poor at every level that it it just the whole thing collapses entirely but um i mean what's what's totally broken about this story as i think raj was saying is that there's no character development and all the conflicts make no sense you know like the the inner conflict of um of roland is uh getting revenge versus saving the entire universe yeah and First of all, this doesn't make any sense because he can save the entire universe by getting revenge, which is what he actually does. So there's no (laughs) conflict there anyway. But then it's like such a stupid conflict anyway, because anything balanced against saving the entire universe just seems stupidly insignificant by comparison. And the fact that you have to have a kid explain this to him just Mm -hmm. makes him seem unbelievably dense and unbelievable as a character. Can I also just say the, the way that his dad died was the worst thing I've ever seen in a movie? Yeah. Like Roland's dad, you mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, it was just the the man in black just said stop breathing, and that was it. It was. Right. Ju- it's like that's the thing that's driving this entire movie. It just seemed awful. Okay. Yep. Noted. All right. <laughs> Back to our regularly scheduled rant. So, um, so, so, what, but what, what would, it, what could have potentially saved this movie, in my opinion, is if Roland had some actual interesting uh, conflict uh, mm-hmm. going on in the movie. And so having not read the books, I I can't, like, say what would be true to the books or not. But I thought it would be interesting if Roland has trained his entire life to be this incredible badass. And then he's very resentful of the fact that Jake has this amazing power that he was just born with, that he hasn't done anything to deserve or earn. 
And um, so Roland's like, okay, well, I need to use you because you have this power that I need to save the tower or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't like you because you're this like millennial punk, like entitled millennial. And Jake would have to prove throughout the course of the story that he's more than just this power that he was born with, that he is actually smart and resourceful on his own. I think like something like that, where there was some sort of interesting character interplay going on, I think could have made this basic plot structure work to a adequate degree. Yeah. Mm. That is kind of close to what their relationship ends up being like in the books, not because Roland's jealous of Jake, because I don't think that's a thing he does, but uh, he sort of struggles with, he feels like it's, it's a quest that he has to take on himself. And so his constant thing is like, he's surrounded by these people who are talented and want to help. And he's constantly being like, no, like this is, you know, this is my battle that I have to fight. And so like going between like relief that they're there to help and feeling guilty that he's accepting the help. Yeah, that was actually going to be like one of my other suggestions was that, yeah, yeah was that Roland doesn't want to, because this is the thing is that I think every story, no matter how fantastical, has to have a relatable emotional mm -hmm. um, conflict yeah. or, um, you know, inner conflict or something. And so, like, I've never been in, a, like, none of us have ever been in a situation where we have to save the universe. And so if, if it's mm -hmm. just that, it's not relatable or interesting. But mm -hmm. all of us have been in a situation where we don't want to accept help or we can't get someone who needs help to accept help. So, so, so there has to be some sort of relatable human drama underlying, you know, and, 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 and that the help can be, I need help to save the universe, whatever, that's fine. But there has to be some sort of core human emotional truth. And there just isn't at all in this yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. Maya, uh, do you, uh, I don't remember the books well enough. Uh, do you, like, how did, how did Roland defeat the man in black in the books? Because like, I don't, I don't, I don't remember that gunfight thing that, that we yeah, see in the movie, it, which is fine. I mean, they, <laughs> they want to do it differently, but I don't remember how he actually does it. Yeah, it was not a stupid gunfight. Um, so <laughs> the, the man in black is basically following him for the entire series. And I think it all culminates in the seventh book. So right when they, um, when they finally get to the Dark Tower. And do you remember, so uh, Susanna gets pregnant with Mordred, who's the spider baby thing. And mm -hmm. uh, he, so Mordred is following them the whole time as they lead up to the, to the tower. Um, and he ends up coming across uh the man in black and he just eats him and that's it and that's how he dies okay which is awesome mm -hmm. right yeah no and, and it's, it's you know just hearing you say some of these uh you know sp specific details yeah. it, it was just making me laugh because uh in prep in preparation for the panel i was just like sort of rereading some of the synopses of the books because you know it's been so long since i read yeah. them and i was just like and i was just like kind of laughing because i was like oh my god like i can't even believe that they tried to make this into a, I know. a movie at all because like when you read the descriptions and this was like on stephen king's official website so this is like yeah. probably like you know as good as descriptions you're <laughs> going to get um for the books and it's like there's so much insane stuff that happens in these books i had solely forgotten about yeah it's crazy um i mean like it's like in the second book it, it like begins with the lobstrosities mm -hmm. uh, oh like, yeah bites, bites off uh you know roland's fingers and one of his toes or something and yep. it's like and he actually calls it a lobstrosity like it's yeah. like that's you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like a giant it's a giant lobster monster uh, for anyone who doesn't know yeah. <laughs> so, so my other thing that i, I want this is totally changing the story probably but i have as i said i haven't read the books but i have heard that in the later books they have to, like, the man in black is trying to kill Stephen King by having him run over with a car, and then people have to try to stop that or something like that. Yeah. And if, if like, there was, like, Stephen King was a character in this, and, like, he was he, his accident was in the movie and stuff, and all that intersected with the um, the gunslinger story, like, that would just blow my mind. I would love, yeah. I would love that. Yeah, it's incredible. Um. So, yeah, so, so, Raj, what do you think of those different ideas that we just threw out there? I mean, I think all of them would be better than what we ended up with. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't know how these people get paid so much money to put out this kind of garbage, to be honest. I mean, to be fair, we're watching a blank screen for two hours is better than what we got. <laughs> well, it's interesting, though, John, because I saw you and Raj actually on Facebook were interacting with um, Alvaro Zemo Samaro. Uh -huh. And he was saying that he thought that critics were being too hard on this movie. And he had a whole right. list of movies that had uh higher rotten tomato scores that he thought were actually worse movies what did you think mm -hmm. of, what did you think about that well i mean i was surprised that he thought that they were being uh too harsh uh, after after seeing it but uh but you know i mean i i agree that uh 
it is kind of uh, strange that that the that the critical reaction is so negative against this compared to some of those other ones. Because yeah, some of those other movies are just like abominations that like you know have no redeeming values whatsoever. And this has very few redeeming values, but there are moments where it's like okay, well, there's a little bit of cool stuff here, and of course, it's based on really cool uh, source material. Although it's harder for me to say how much of my um my my you know uh my view of of anything in the movie kindly uh is anything but my just love for the source material you know so um but yeah i mean yeah i i, I did think that was interesting i mean because yeah because a lot of the movies they listed were just like just terrible like i mean and, i mean and a bunch of them were just things like i would never see that because <laughs> it's just so, so obviously going to be terrible however um, i would watch jupiter ascending like every single time <laughs> over this because that's a delightfully bad movie i i enjoy watching that that movie it's terrible but it's it's fun to watch like this movie had there's the every like the only parts that i was like ah that's a little bit fun where the ways that the heat like reloaded his his pistols which i was mm-hmm. like had to watch through the most of the entire movie before you kind of mm-hmm. saw that but um that was about it um, and I think I've seen a lot of apologists online for this movie saying like, oh, no, this is really like an important movie or it's really good or whatever. But to me, I think it fails, again, the fans of the books and it fails people who've never yeah. seen the book. So I kind of don't get how anyone looks at this and says, no, no, it's good. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I also just I don't I mean, I'm getting older, so I don't have time for bad movies anymore. <laughs> so you know, like at least though with a bad book, you can put it down after you've read the first chapter, but like mm-hmm. you're in the theater and I, I, I don't usually walk out of theaters and obviously I needed to watch the whole thing for this, right. but, um, but yeah, I wish, I wish I hadn't seen it. <laughs> I would have definitely stopped watching this if I wasn't watching it for a panel. I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, I have walked out of movies, uh, at the theater, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I if I was just home watching this, I would definitely turned it off after, you know, 10 minutes or something. Yeah, well, I mean, because, uh, I mean, I think to be fair to Alvaro, he wasn't saying it was good. He was just saying that it wasn't uh, as right. bad as the critics were making it out to be. But I agree, sure, sure. I agree that um, I have not, like, like I've and I've defended on this show, I've defended Jupiter Ascending, I've defended um, Valerian as movies that are, like, have serious, serious problems and are awful in all sorts of ways, but have, like, enough sort of bonkers shit in them that you've never seen before that if you're a science fiction fan and you love this stuff and you want to see all the bonkers shit people can put into a movie, that they're worth watching. And this right. was the first movie that I saw in a movie theater that I can remember in, like, in a long, long time that I was just sorry I watched it, that I just felt like it was, <laughs> I had completely wasted my time. Well, and you know what's hilarious about that is that, like I was saying earlier, it's like the Dark Tower books are full of that crazy, wacky shit. Yeah. You know, there's so much shit that you'd never seen in a movie before in those books that you could have put in the movie or, you know, tried to showcase some of in the movie. I mean, it's like, it, although again, like, it's just impossible. It's like it needed to be a TV show with, with the with the space to tell the story like Game of Thrones does, like, you know, over the course of many hours of, of uh, entertainment. Um, and, and it was just a fool's errand to begin with to try to cram it into a movie, especially one of only 90 minutes. But, um, but yeah, no, I agree that, yeah, like, and like you were saying earlier, Dave, it's like this, every, so much of what we watched in the movie is just like so familiar. It's like, it's like pulling in all these different parts of other things that, that we've already seen, which I mean that, and I mean, not to keep, uh, trashing Akiva Goldman, but I mean, I feel like that's what his movies tend to have. Uh, as their, 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 uh, as the one thing that's similar about them is that, that they feel like that a lot. You know, so yeah, I don't know. Timai, I want to get you back in here. Do you have any anything you want to add? Uh, I, I mean, I'm. I just keep coming back to like I don't understand what the motivation was of the people who were involved in this in this movie because I feel like if it's got to be that they're such big fans of the Dark Tower that they were like, we have to do this. Like, that, you know, this has to be on the big screen. Stephen King has been saying forever that he doesn't think it belongs on the big screen because it's hard to do and it's like sort of nonsensical. And he, he like the reason that people think so many of his movies are terrible is because it doesn't translate from like his brain to like actual vis- visuals. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like the the only part of the movie that I genuinely enjoyed, which I did enjoy, was the whole, I mean, everyone's saying this, but, like, when Roland was in New York and sort of, like, struggling to understand our ways, um, mm-hmm. I thought that was really cute. But, again, it didn't really feel like Roland. It just, it felt like a cute scene from another movie. That was my favorite, actually, I have yeah. to say, when he's like, 
do the animals here still talk? I was like, that's pretty (laughs) awesome. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, and I think that gave you a little glimpse of like his world is like our world in the far future, which they didn't really touch on. Like it, it, that was the only that. And when they're talking about the amusement park was the only time that Mm -hmm. you're like, there's actually connections between these two worlds. Yeah. I wanted to mention the amusement park because just the idea that it would be far in the future and people, and there would just be these giant structures and people were like, I don't know what those things are. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I agree. Like some of the fish out of water stuff was the sort of some of the only moments where I actually kind of smiled for a minute. Yeah. You know? uh, like I, I enjoyed when he went to the doctor and, and he was like trying to pay her and, so and stuff good. like that. Like, like, you know, some of that stuff was good, but I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like, it's not, it's not less. That's not what I was. That's not what that I didn't want that to be the best thing about this movie, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, and actually another thing that like sort of made me think of, um, uh, of how it's like, like a lot of these scenes are like things we've seen in other movies. It's like, it's like when he takes him to get the hot dog, it's like, okay, I mean, that was kind of funny, but then on the other hand, it's also like, well, yeah, that's exactly what I expected to happen. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, Oh, you got somebody in New York. Who's not from this world. Of course, you're going to give him a hot dog, you know? And, <laughs> and it's just like, uh, it's like that I'm grasping for, for something as, as, as boring as that to be like, Oh yeah, well that was kind of amusing for a second, but on the other hand, completely expected. It's, it's just such a sad state, uh, statement about the movie overall. Yeah. I'll just add, John, on the subject of Akiva Goldsmith, because it seems like he has this knack for, or I mean, I, again, I don't know for sure if he, he's to blame. I'm, I'm just guessing here, but mm-hmm. of, of making like an iRobot movie that is the opposite of the point of the book uh yes. an i am legends movie that's the opposite of the point yep. of the book and a dark tower movie that i don't know i can't say if it's the opposite of the point of the book but mm-hmm. has apparently nothing you know nothing of the point of the book in it yeah clearly clearly he doesn't care much about the source material uh or you know being faithful to it in in that way like in the in the sort of core sense of what those things are at their core um you know, whereas like, you know, yeah, he pulls all the different, uh, different plot elements and character elements and, and a lot of, a lot of times just changes them completely. But, um, even, even in cases like in, in the Dark Tower where it's like, okay, well, there's these characters and general situations that we're familiar with, but then just completely betrays them. Well, and, and like Raj was saying about the, how the movie is like, it's like wearing this human skin <laughs> over something yeah. that's not human. That's a really good metaphor. I mean, the metaphor I had was that I thought, thought that this movie was like one of those cargo cult, um, where they take a cargo cults, where they take a, uh, um, coconut and carve it into a radio or something where it mm-hmm. kind of looks like a radio, but there's nothing inside it that would actually make it function. Um, right. and this movie, it, it's like a simulacrum of storytelling where, you know, they're like, okay, I know the characters are supposed to like, not like each other at first. And I know that they're supposed to like each other in the movie. And I know there's supposed mm-hmm. to be a big fight. And I know there's supposed to be a part toward the, before the big fight where they really don't like each other. And so it, it like, goes like like sort of like automaton like goes through all those motions but does not actually have any gears or anything inside making <laughs> it do those things you know it's it's just the 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 sick semblance of life rather than actual life right so like so so you know like so cuz all all cuz cause, cause, cause if there's ever any like any part where this movie has to make a choice between adhering in the most slavish way possible to hollywood formula versus mm-hmm. logic it always goes with A over B, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so, like, the scene where, oh, my God, the scene where, like, Jake's like, oh, you don't care that they killed my mom. Fuck you. Like, you know, it's you can just see the screener. It's like, okay, well, at minute, whatever, you know, they have to have, this has to be the, the darkest hour where the characters, like, mm-hmm. have a big fight. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but whatever. It's on the outline, so we got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I mean, uh, what, one thing that I worry is that, like, okay, so some of these Akiva Goldsman movies have made money, and I think that's why he keeps getting these gigs, you know, like, to adapt this or that, or to, like, you know, to write this science fiction screenplay, or whatever. Like, I think I, Robot did okay, and, um, I'm not sure if Batman and Robin did okay. I think it probably actually did, although everyone hated it. But, I mean, uh, but, and the, the, Dark, the Dark Tower, even though everyone hates it, it, it I think it won the box office this week. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it's like, it, no, he's never going to, no one's ever going to hold him accountable. Like he's just going to keep ruining things. <sighs> um, so wait, so, so Maya was saying that, um, they could have just done the gunslinger and they could have just filmed it out in the desert. It would have been fine. Right. Yeah. So, so Maya, why do you, do you have any idea why they didn't just make the gunslinger movie? I have no idea. I don't understand. I, I think this was such a weird combination of like, it's sort of, 
70% one of the books, but then it pulls in these random things from the other books, but not any of the good parts. I, I really don't, mm-hmm. I really don't understand. I, I think whoever said earlier, I forget who it was that said he, you know, he, he's just sort of pulling in like pieces that somebody told him are important for the different characters. Like that's what it feels like happened, you know, is that he was sort of like, okay, Jake has a troubled home and like Roland's mad, but like he didn't care why Roland's mad, you know? Uh, I don't know. That's what it felt like to me. I, I, it seems like such an obvious movie to make into either an amazing TV show or like an epic series of movies like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. I don't understand why that didn't happen. It doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense to me. Does anyone have any possible theories for why they didn't just make a gunslinger movie? <laughs> Someone explain this. I mean, my only, my only theory is that um, because of this whole sort of simultaneous TV show thing or whatever that they're talking about, or this TV show that's going to follow and going to be a prequel, uh, you know, that's why I heard it described as yeah. being a prequel to the movie. So, I mean, maybe that's what they plan to do in the TV show. I don't know. I mean, um, I heard the, that's my only thought. I heard the show is going to be based on Wizard and Glass, which is the fourth book, mm-hmm. which is like mm-hmm. the, that's the flashback for Roland, right. which is awesome. Right. So, so- yeah. But that's even more reason why the movie should have been the first book. Like, show mm-hmm. show people what Roland is now and then do the flashback. But instead, it, yeah. it, it just... It, the other... I'll just say the other thing that really bothered me was the way this movie ended, which is, like, it feels like it's all resolved because he kills the man in black. But that's not... That's mm-hmm. such a... T- again, like, in the books, he's not even the one who takes him out. He's not, like, the bad guy. Like, that's, yeah. that's not the end of his quest. So I just... I feel like it makes his, the whole concept seem so small and unimportant. Um, and I think that's what really made me mad. I think they were just afraid to do, I mean, you know, like, again, they wouldn't put a cowboy hat on him. You know, I <laughs> yeah. think they were afraid to go into that kind of Western y mode, yeah. you know, post-apocalyptic Western where there's, you know, you know, there's, they were just afraid, I think. But if they'd done it with care and, you know, drawing from the source material, I think people would have, would have responded to it. But again, they gave us some kind of weird transmogrified, Mm -hmm. you know, alternate universe watered down take on it. And, you know, like I, I I get maybe that they wanted to save the flashback stuff for something else, but Mm -hmm. we didn't even get, you know, the one scene we got of Roland was him and his father in the woods, like in some kind of aimless thing and there was that throwaway line about his guns and there was nothing about you know there were little bits and pieces they obviously the the you know the oath or whatever that that he mm-hmm. says but i i feel like you could have thrown in some stuff from gilead in there and yeah. that would have made it so much better than it was you okay. know i mean wait wait Raj, you were one you were 100 percent right and i now i'm 100 percent certain what happened okay i 100 <laughs> percent guarantee you that so, that somebody maybe like Rod uh, Ron um, Howard went in and said, "I want to do the Gunslinger movie. It's gonna." And they're like, "What is that?" And he's like, "It's like a western with some fantasy sci-fi elements." <laughs> and they said, "Hmm, the last time someone made a movie like that was mm-hmm. Cowboys and Aliens, and that didn't do well, so we can't do that." Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I had the same thought while he was talking, and and it's like, yeah, it's like it goes back to how you're describing how the screenplay seems to be written where, you know, you, you go this very paint by numbers thing. And it's like, Oh, well, no, the, the rules say that you have to have this happen this at this moment, even though it doesn't make any sense. And yeah, no, it's the same kind of bullshit received wisdom of, of, of Hollywood, uh, you know, or institutional wisdom of, of, of Hollywood that, Oh, well, no, just obviously uh, since Cowboys and aliens didn't do well, this won't do well. And so we have to make it not Western as much as we can. But I still maintain it's it's bad at following the rules because obviously one of the most famous, you know, screenwriting books is Save the Cat. And the idea is that you have to have a scene where you kind of show the main character being good. You know, the Save the Cat moment where, you know, they they demonstrate the, the quality of their character. And Jake never has that moment. And Roland never has that moment. And it's like, you know, so that doesn't happen. And then... I, I feel like there's so many missed opportunities for, you no, know. But, but, but Raj, 100% fucking guarantee you, in the original two and a half hour cut of this movie, yeah. they each saved like eight cats. Yeah. And then people were like, it's boring watching them save all these cats. And so they cut it all out. All right. Fair enough. I think, honestly, I think the the problem you're describing is the same problem that the books suffer from. Like, I avoided the the Dark Tower series for years, even though I loved Stephen King, because it's described as, like, a futuristic Western, which sounds really confusing and weird. Um, like, you know, for I, Raj, like, it sounds like that's, that's your thing. Like, that's what you like reading. I had never read anything like that before. And I was like, it just sounds like a lot of work. Like, I don't really understand what that means. And when you're reading it, 
you're not thinking this is a Western or this is sci-fi or this is fantasy. You're, it's just a great story. Um, and yeah. so I could totally see how that pitch kind of scared people away if they didn't just read the book and understand it. And the first book's so short, so like they could have easily made a movie of it too. I mean, you know, I, I agree that it probably would make a better series. To be honest, I loved the idea of the first one so much that when the second one started bringing in like, you know, real world earth into it, I was like, eh, I don't know. But I was already sold mm-hmm. on the concept by then, so I went with yeah. it and of course enjoyed it. Yeah. But yeah. So, um, so Maya, you said that this isn't the worst Stephen King movie you've ever seen. <laughs> What is the worst Stephen King movie you've ever seen, and how much worse is it than this? Uh, there's so many bad ones. I At one point, I, I tried to go through and watch all the Stephen King movies, and I had to stop doing it because I was like, this is just not worth it, especially because he doesn't like half of them. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, the worst one that comes to mind for me is Dreamcatcher. Um, ha! Knew it. It's really <laughs> bad. Uh, but, I, I mean, if you ask anybody, like, there's uh, some of the ones that people talk about um, – I'm trying to remember what the word, like everyone hates the stand miniseries. Like there's, oh, the dead zone I tried to watch and it has a uh, Christopher Walken in it. And I like, which sounds like it would be so good. And it was so awful. It sort of, it had a lot of the same problems as this one where it was just like, it was like everyone was reading off cue cards. Like it just didn't seem like they were sold into the the story. The Tommy knockers was really bad. The miniseries. Um, I mean, there's like a lot that were really bad. I liked the Stan miniseries, but that was back in the 90s, so yeah. it might not hold up. I, I, yeah, I, I liked the Dead Zone when I saw it as a kid, but I was yeah. a kid, so who knows. Yeah. Um, I just tried to watch The Mist, and I watched mm-hmm. the, the new TV series, and I watched two episodes, and what happened at the end of the second episode was so fucking stupid that I gave up entirely at that point. Yeah. So what, what happens? <sighs> Uh, okay, I'm um, spoiler warning. Um, let's see if I can remember. They, they, this, this, they, there's this mist infested hallway that they have to go into to try to get a radio to radio for help. They're stuck in a mall with mist all around them, and they draw like lots to see who's going to do it um, for no other reason than because it's going to make the main character be the one who has to go in when otherwise it would make no sense. And then after she uh, is sort of like forced to go in, this other guy says uh, that he'll go along with her. But then he turns out to be part of like a military conspiracy and he tries to kill her. And then but then she kills him. But then she like tells people that uh, a monster got him or something. Uh, I, I've, I've pretty much tried to block it out. But it was just like everything yeah. about it was so hokey and unpersuasive and uh, psychologically preposterous and uh, just fucking dumb that uh, I, I, I just don't understand. Like, I mean, Maya, you were saying that it's hard to translate Stephen King's vision to yeah. the screen but I, I feel like i could do it like dude get send me those things i will I adapt think, the fuck out of those things they'll yeah. be so good yeah um, i think i could too that's what i said after the dark tower movie i was like this is so easy i don't understand what the problem is but i think it's that when you really step back and i guess some people have already said this but his his writing is pretty like the the dialogue and stuff is pretty bad if you think about it like i mean i think it's i think he's a genius and i love it but like just in terms of like the rules of writing and character development and like he's very repetitive and there's a lot of things that are sort of like tropes and whatever, but like it works in the context of the story because there's so much like there's so much exposition and there's so much interesting stuff happening that like you almost don't need the characters to have amazing dialogue all the time. But I feel like in a movie, like I had the same problem with, um, did you guys watch the 112263 series? We did a whole episode about it. Yeah. Did you guys like it? Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Oh, I hated it. I was just so mad the whole time because it's like it just but I haven't I haven't read the books right and that's the thing is like I think when you're comparing it to the books like the book felt so epic and romantic and amazing and then in the series it's like okay it's just James Franco like flirting with somebody and like that's so not what the book was about um so I just think that like I I guess part of the problem I think is that people try to hone in on like the the main plot point and every Stephen King book has so many layers and so many subplots Mm. and so many like secondary characters and I think that's what makes them so compelling like any book of his you read there's going to be like hundreds of characters in it and you remember all of them and they're all so interesting Mm. and in a movie they're like okay so it's a romance or okay it's a horror movie and like I think they just sort of it doesn't seem important to bring in the other stuff and I think obviously the exceptions are you know movies like The Green Mile or Shawshank where you actually get to know like the side characters and you get to see like the magic um but I think it's just really hard to do that. Let me just say about the Mist TV series because 
you know, you would, you know, just, just, it's just basic human psychology stuff. Like you have a bunch of monsters outside the mall. Mm -hmm. Does everybody stand in front of the giant glass door? <laughs> no, they would lock <laughs> themselves in some like offices or something, or like start piling stuff in front of the glass mm -hmm. doors to block them off, which I'm almost certain is what happens in the novella. Um, although I read it a really long time yeah. ago. But um, yeah, go ahead. But that's that's the other problem is that I think in the movies and the TV shows, they're so focused on what like what looks good on the screen, whereas Stephen mm -hmm. King doesn't have to worry about that. So he can have people like off doing interesting things in corners. But in the show, it's like they have to have the big wide shot of everybody looking at the mist. Like, you know, I think it's tough to balance. We can't talk about we, we can't talk about where Stephen King adaptations and not discuss Maximum Overdrive. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if I haven't actually ever seen it, but the story trucks that it's based on is so good. Yeah. Oh, man. It's so, I, I mean, it's it's actually insane that they even tried to make that into a movie. But um, but it's so good. Also, like, he it, he yeah, directed yeah, that. Right, right, right. And then and he was like, OK, maybe that I, I'm I'm done. Like, I don't need <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm not cut out for this, um, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, I mean, I, that's a movie that's sort of been notoriously described as just like one of the worst movies ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just a shame though, because like, it, and it's like it, it is one of those. It is kind of a, a sort of proving uh, the point that it's like it, it can be very challenging to turn his work, you know, his work into into you know visual media, um, even when he's doing it himself. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Well, actually, on that point, John, I was watching a YouTube video and they were making the point that maybe Stephen King is just, you know, that um, film is not his thing, you mm -hmm. know, and they were mm -hmm. saying that like that he doesn't like Stanley Kubrick's um, adaptation of The Shining, which is right. terrific. And and he constantly says, oh, you, you know, whenever things coming out, like, oh, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. It's good. I've seen it. Yeah. And then it's like horrible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, does he like The Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. Yeah, but who okay. doesn't like I mean, the Shawshank Redemption? Well, I mean, sure, but I mean, uh, no, yeah, that's a fair what people point. say about The Shining, you know. So, I mean, I'm just curious, like on his scale, you know, I mean, if he if he hates The Shining, but then also, but then on the other hand, does like Shawshank Redemption. If he also didn't like Shawshank Redemption, then we'd be like, okay, well, if Stephen King likes the adaptation, then it's probably terrible. But if he hates it, it's probably great. Right. You know, like, very confusing, but. <laughs> uh, see, Raj, you want to jump in here with anything about Stephen King, other Stephen King adaptations, or anything? You know, I. I've not read a lot of Stephen King. Um, you know, I'm not a horror guy and, you know, I've seen a lot of the movies, but I, I, I just, I read some of the short stories back in the day. Um, I don't think I've read any of the, of, of the novels. And so, I mean, it, it, the Dark Tower lured me in just because of the Western aspect and because I had heard about, you know, it was this long epic series and there were alternate dimensions and those are all things that like work for me. Um, but, the great thing about the Dark Tower series is that it starts like touching on a lot of his different works. So, you know, I, I finished the first four books and now I'm kind of taking a pause to go into, you know, like Salem's Lot and some mm -hmm. other stories like that so that I can kind of get the background on some of these characters that show up. Um, but I kind of love one of the things I love about those the Dark Tower books specifically is that they draw on so many inspirations and, you know, like Watership Down is one of my favorite ever books. And like he has inspirations from Watership Down in his stuff. And, you know, he adapts some of the language um, from those books. Like I think, I think it's Sylphle, which is basically like, I think when they eat, I think that's what it is. But like he has that in his books. And I, I just love little touches like that or the fact that, the bears named Shardik, which mm -hmm. is another Richard yeah. Adams uh, books and like little moments like that, I think make it feel like I'm reading something, you know, from a, from somebody who's maybe, you know, not a friend, but like someone who, who gets the whole thing. Um, but, but yeah, I'd love to read his uh, other stuff and I, I, that's on my list. Um, and I just picked up on writing cause it, I don't, I don't know why it took me so long to get around to it as a writer, but um, that's another thing that's on my list. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to diving into his prose work and, and kind of seeing what's there. Can I give you other recommendations related to The Dark Tower? Sure. I know that there's the, the what is it, Rose Matter? Is that the one? Is it, Or maybe I'm confusing it's that. Insomnia. Go ahead. Yeah, in, You're probably thinking yeah insomnia. insomnia is the big one. Rose Matter is mentioned, but it's not one of the big ones. But I would say uh, Insomnia, it... And um, Hearts in Atlantis are the big ones. Oh, right. Hearts in well, Atlantis. That's mm -hmm. the one I was yeah. thinking of, yeah. 
I mean, Loman, you, just just Low Men in Yellow Coats, right? Yeah. Like the first story. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but that's great. You know, you have to read that if you're if, if you're a Dark Tower fan. There's also, okay. I mean, there's also a bunch of other characters from short stories that show up in the Dark Tower. So one really good one that I feel like a lot of people gloss over is uh, in the Everything's Eventual, the story Everything's Eventual. Mm-hmm. The main character mm-hmm. of that shows up in the Dark Tower and has a really interesting. Oh right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about yeah. that. So there's a, there's just so much of it. I had a conversation like this recently um, with some friends on the way back from a convention and I, I almost gave up because I was like, there's too many <laughs> things that I need to read before I can actually read the thing I want to yeah. read. Yeah, but, right. Um, but it's fun. It's fun. Well, I love I love on writing. Uh, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I want to tell what you were saying, Raj, though, made me wonder. Um, we've said that The Gunslinger, you could just adapt that into a movie. Are there any other, any other books? Any of the other books or parts of the books where you just like, oh, they should just take like chapter three to chapter 12 and that would be a perfect mm-hmm. movie. My, uh, how about Maya? What do you think about that? Oh, like of <laughs> Stephen King books specifically? No, of the, uh, of the if you were to make a Dark Tower movie, oh. could you just take like part of book four and that would be a good movie on its own? Yeah, ab- I think any of the books could be a standalone. Maybe not six and seven. Those get a little too weird. But all the other ones. Part of the thing about the Dark Tower is every book has its own um, style and its own plot so like book two you could read without reading book one or book three and it would be this amazing standalone book and i think that's true i would say for one through five they could totally do that five maybe would be tough but i think you could do it because i got the impression that they're going to take parts of book three and make like a prequel or something based on the flashbacks uh well, is that book four i think book four okay book, yeah, four. book four yeah so it's book four. Does that seem like a good idea to you? Totally. Yeah. So book four okay. is, it's a complete standalone. It's actually really funny. Cause like you get really deep, you get halfway through the dark tower and you're like, Oh my God, I can't wait to hear what, to see what happens next. And then you get to book four and it, there's just no mention of anything else. It's like a flashback mm-hmm. of his childhood and you have to read, you know, 900 pages before you can get back to the dark tower. Um, but it's really good. And and then you have to wait like 15 years. Or something <laughs> before right. The next one. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so 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 are you guys still on board with the TV show then? Like, are what, do, are you planning to watch it? Because I think it's a lot of the same people involved in yeah. making it. I don't know. I mean, I have zero expectations, but I mean, I, I'd watch the first episode grudgingly, probably. Yeah, I think I would too. I wish they'd just done what Ron Howard originally wanted to do, which I think was like bookended movies yeah. and series in between. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, again, somebody like him would probably have a little bit more artistic integrity in terms of, you know, capturing what, what made it work. Um, and I think that way you could have presented a movie that wasn't necessarily book one, um, as a kind of like introduction to the world and then kind of, reversed back and shown kind of maybe even through flashback totally. what Roland had been through and and that would have worked really well uh and I I really never understand why Hollywood makes these decisions cuz I think mm-hmm. when you talk to anyone I know everyone's like oh yeah that sounds like a terrible idea or like it would have been so much better if they did this but you know when money is involved and mm-hmm. egos are involved I think things take bad turns yeah uh, I, I would just want—I just wanted to throw out there that, like, so if anybody listening to this actually wants to read *The Dark Tower* and you haven't read it already, um, obviously keep in mind some of the stuff we've been saying about how there's all this ancillary material, like you know, like *Loman in Yellow Coats* or *Insomnia*, that stuff like that. Um, and I think in uh, the later Dark Tower books, like there's a sort of uh, there's a list of the stories uh, or well, there's a list of the books that Stephen King has previously published in the front of the book. And then there's like an asterisk next to the ones that are sort of mm-hmm. relevant to the Dark Tower. And and of course, you can find other uh, references online and stuff that are pointing out the, the, the ones that are most important. Like the dairy um, connection. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, but but if, if you are just jumping in for the first time, I really highly recommend the audiobooks. Um I don't like the current ones that are read by George Guidall, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but Frank Muller did the original audiobooks, and they're so good. And I mean, maybe it's just because like those were my first. Uh, th- that was the way I first encountered um, books two through set or two through four. Four. I guess. And then, yeah, um, because uh, I read the original stories uh, of the in, in the Gunslinger. I read that book by like as I just read it, and then I listened to the audiobooks of two through four, and they're so great. And so like that became like my voice for what Roland sounds like to me and George Goodall I never actually really liked as a narrator much but but Frank Muller really was fantastic um unfortunately like he had a big motorcycle accident and he died and um uh and then and then um eventually they re-released audiobooks with just George Goodall narrating all of them so it's like it's pretty hard to find the Frank Muller ones at this point um 
But I mean, if you can find them, like I would definitely recommend them. But um, otherwise, I would just say r- read the books regularly because I, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not a George Bedell fan, although a lot of people love him. So I, I will second that because that's how I I listen to also books two through four. I read the first one, um, and he does a great job, uh, especially like you know he gives Eddie that kind of accent he needs, mm-hmm. and you know, so I, I I will just say that I enjoyed those as well. Well, I guess we could maybe say, too, that, um, you know, if you have already read The Dark Tower and you want more like that and this movie isn't doing it for you, we did two episodes, as Roz mentioned, with, uh, you know, Weird West books and comics and Weird West movies. So you could go check those out and, you know, explore the world of Weird Westerns more. Um, and did we did we also do a panel on uh, when, I, when, my, when my anthology Other Worlds Than These came out? Um, you know, like things that deal with, like, parallel worlds and portal fantasies. I mean, there's lots of stories that are portal fantasies, which, you know, the, the, the Dark Tower is one of, you know, obviously they go from world world to world and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's there's lots of material along those lines as well, if, uh, if, if, if that's the sort of part of the Dark Tower that you gravitated towards. I, yeah, I yeah. would also add, if you want to read more stuff by Stephen King that's like this, um, The Talisman and Black House are amazing. Mm. It's like my second mm-hmm. favorite after Dark Tower. All right, cool. So, Maya, you mentioned It as well. Are you looking forward to the It movie? I super am. That that one actually looks good. <laughs> yeah, the trailer looks freaking amazing. Yeah, and it, you know... Well, <laughs> You know, what's so funny is that, like, you know, we're sitting here saying, like, this didn't feel like the Dark Tower and some of the casting was weird or whatever. When I saw the It trailer, it all the characters look how I imagined them when I was reading the books. Mm-hmm. And they're doing two movies. Do I have that right? Yeah. Two It movies? Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, can I just jump in there? Something about casting? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, one thing I just wanted to talk briefly about with casting, you know, it's like, I, I think we all agreed that Idris Elba was great, and, um, but, I mean, I think, and, I, and I've seen some commentary of people talking about, like, how diverse the movie is in general, like, and, which I, which I did appreciate, of course, um, but, like, yeah, like, uh, in, in Roland's world, like, a lot of, it was very diverse, you know, the, the, the seer was Asian, and there was, there were other black characters and everything, so, I mean, I, I, I like that, and, and, but, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just so sad that, um, that I fear that Hollywood will take the wrong lessons from this. That you know, that there's going to be yeah. this critic, there's this critical failure, and they're going to blame it on that. Like, I mean, much in the way we've seen happen in other industries, like you know, you see like uh, Marvel having um, uh, struggling uh, with with sales, and and, and you, you know, you hear this, you hear this uh, commentary from insiders saying like, oh, well, it, it's clear that uh, the people don't want to, you know, people don't want diversity in their comics or whatever, and so that must be why we have declining sales. Mm-hmm. And and I just feel like Hollywood always learns the wrong lessons from failures, um, and I'm worried that 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 that's the lesson they're going to learn from in this, uh, even though it doesn't have anything to do with why the movie's terrible. I think when Black Panther comes out and starts breaking records, I think that's mm-hmm. when they'll hopefully, you know, realize that 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 isn't the case. Um, which I, I actually have a lot of faith in, in, in what Marvel's been doing. But, but yeah, I mean, I think you always have people saying, oh, this is why it didn't work. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the fact that there's a magical Negro narrative in this, in this storyline is deeply disturbing to yeah. me, you know? I mean, right. they didn't get it from the first place. I, again, diversity is fine, but like, you know, it, it's not, I mean, not diversity is fine. Diversity is important. Sorry. But I feel like they didn't go far enough in this movie. Right. Well, no, I mean, clearly, like I, like I was saying earlier, I mean, it's like, yeah, that's, it's, I, I applaud the, the notion of, of casting independently of whatever the race of the character in the book was, but then like to completely subvert it that way, it's like, oh, well, you just, any, any positive gains you got from doing that, just like you've pushed it way, way, way into the negative column now, because like, no, that's fucked up, you know, that, so. Yeah. I also hope that Matthew McConaughey enjoyed the hell out of chewing all that scenery because <laughs> oh his, his man in black was so over the top. Yeah. And yes. I, I kind of loved it in a way because I was like, okay, you know, this is a boring fucking movie. So Matthew McConaughey, have fun with it. Do what you need to do. Um, it didn't work for me, but I hope he enjoyed himself. So. Yeah. Me neither. I hated it. I, I hated his <laughs> yeah. performance. I, I, I didn't like it at all. And I usually like him. Like, I mean, he's fantastic in True Detective. Like, I, like, so great in that. Um, and, and I, and he's been in lots of other stuff that I've liked him in, but like, oh my God. Yeah. And I just did not like him at all in this. And, but I thought on this, like, you know, seeing the trailer and stuff, I was like, oh yeah, no, he seems like a good choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I didn't deliver. I mean, and I, I suspect that it was partially the direction. I mean, I, you know, yeah. obviously he's capable of gl- delivering a good performance, but, 
you know, that's what the director wanted or that's what the director was satisfied with. And, you know, so. Well, let me say too, John, about what you were saying about Hollywood always learning the wrong list. You know, there's this experiment. I think it's with pigeons, but you give them food at completely random intervals and they start doing all these weird rituals and things because they're trying to guess why you're giving them food. And it, of course, it's completely just random. And that's kind of what Hollywood is like, where, you know, <laughs> like they're like, oh, it's because of the hats. It's because the guy was wearing the hat. And then they're like, no more hats, you know. <laughs> and I, I just, it's, I'm, I'm sure like if you work for one of these companies, maybe it makes sense or something. But it's like, you know, if you make a like crap movie with terrible characters and terrible dialogue and, you know, all this stuff, no logic or a real reality, sense of reality to it. It's not the hat, you know, it's seriously, it's not because the guy was wearing a hat. That's that's not the thing, you know. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right. So I don't know. Maybe we should start wrapping this up before yeah. we uh, before uh, we get start yeah. spiraling into a... <laughs> despair. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would just uh, mention briefly. Uh, so I I have this like weird personal connection. I feel like to the Dark Tower because uh, so you know I worked for many years at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and the the stories that uh, make up the, the the first book, the Gunslinger, it's actually like five novelettes mm -hmm. that and they originally appeared in the in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and so like that was like one of the coolest things to me like when I discovered that, um, and so uh, and so I was re you know I was in the midst of my sort of Dark Tower fandom uh, when I was working there at a certain point I was like you know I was catching up with the with the the different books and everything uh, that I hadn't read yet, and um, and so I'm just I'm just at the office one day, and the phone rings, and it's Stephen King. Wow, he's calling the office because uh, you know we besides publishing the Dark Tower stories, we'd actually published lots of his different stories over the years, and he and he loves the magazine, um, and uh, so. Uh, my boss was actually doing a subscription drive, and at some point, um, uh, Stephen King had subscribed to the magazine, and on the memo line on the check, he said, this is the best fiction magazine in America. Um, and uh, so my boss was doing a new subscription drive, and so he had sent the fax over to King's people or whatever and said, hey, you know, we'd, we, we'd like to do um, a promotional mailing. Is it all right if we use this quote from Steve, you know? Um, and so, uh, we, you know, he was expecting, you know, his people to call back or whatever, but then uh, Stephen King just calls, and I happen to answer the phone. So I talked to Stephen King for, like, two minutes. Um, but, he's, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it was just just like a really geek out moment for me. And I was like, I really had to, I, I was, I was sort of simultaneously kicking myself and also glad that I restrained the impulse to say thank you, Sai, yeah. to him after, <laughs> as, as I asked him to hang up. Like I didn't, I didn't. I just totally played it like, uh, like, yo, oh, you're just like any other person that's yeah. calling. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pass along the message. Yep. Thanks. You know, um, whatever. But uh, yeah, it's just, I always thought that was cool. And I just, I want to reiterate our longstanding offer to Stephen King to appear on this show. Um, all that stuff before I said about you having poor taste in your movie adaptations. I, I, I don't know. I was crazy. I don't know what I was saying. I didn't mean it at all. Uh, please come on our show. Um, wait, I had something I was just going to say. Uh, uh, now I can't think of what it was. Anyone else? Anyone else have anything they want to add? Uh, I was just going to say, I, I have a similar, a less cool, I didn't talk to Stephen King, but I feel like I have a personal connection with the Dark Tower. And I think that's one of the magical things about it is I think a lot of people have that uh, experience reading it. But when I, so when I finished, you know, he has the scene of him getting, getting hit uh, by the van and it's like exactly word for word how it happened in real life. And so afterwards I was mm -hmm. looking up the real story of, you know, who the guy was in the van and what happened. And like, you can find news articles that are like referenced in the book that actually exist. So it's this really cool, like real world crossover. And I started mm -hmm. looking up all the places that are mentioned in the book in New York city. And I found the, um, Hammerskjold Plaza is a place I, I know this now, but I didn't know at the time it actually exists in New York city. So it's like, yeah. it's at second and 46. And I was looking it up on Google maps and it's right across from from the building where my parents got married and I was like whoa like that you know it's like such a stretch but it's like just the fact that the real world was written into the books and then that I had some tiny connection to it felt like you know it was right after I read it and I was all emotional and I think that that happens for a lot of people when they read it because it's like you feel not just attached to the story but because part of it takes place in you know Keystone Earth is our earth it's like there's all these opportunities to feel like you're really part of the story. Do they call it Keystone Earth in the books? Because I couldn't remember that. I don't know. I don't remember either. I think they do. But I'm not sure. Okay, I remember what I was going to say. So so years ago, I um, I was talking to someone who was a really big Stephen King fan. And she told me that she had heard 
that when he wrote The Gunslinger, he had like gone to a cabin in the woods and dropped acid and wrote the book in a week. Mm. And mm. Uh, I was just curious, Maya, do you have any, uh, as our Stephen King resident, Stephen King expert, do you have any idea if that's true or not? I actually haven't heard that. So I heard that he was working on The Gunslinger for weeks in college. Um, so maybe part of that was he went to the woods and dropped acid. Um, but I think it was it was sort of like my impression is he struggled writing it for a while. It was his first book. Um, and he thought it was terrible and he sort of, you know, put it aside and wasn't going to do anything else with it. Um, so, and I actually, I think that's why it got published in the magazine is because he was doing like parts at a time. Um, so I don't think that's true, but it's possible. I don't know about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's unlikely that he wrote the whole thing that way. Yeah. Certainly. I mean, it's possible that he came up with the original idea and wrote the first story or something yeah. like that. Um, it, under the influence of some drugs. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, I don't know, I never heard acid, but I, I'd heard that like at a certain point in his career, he had done a lot of cocaine oh, and yeah. something like that. But I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I, that's... Um, I, I had, I have read it. I mean, maybe right. it's a non-writing for all I know. That's... All right. Well, if anyone listening to this was at that cabin with Stephen <laughs> King and can shed some light on this, we would really appreciate it. I love that story because I mean, one of the things about the dark tower, you know, this tower that spans universes it reminds me of michael moorcock and tana Lorne and like all the interconnections between his works and so you know that's kind of what michael moorcock used to do he would just like write a novel in a weekend or a week and i think he was fond of acid at a time so like that makes me happy yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay any final thoughts i think that's actually a pretty good note to end on um but i don't know any, any final thoughts any 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 of you guys I have a thought. I hope that this movie doesn't deter people from reading The Dark Tower because it's really good. That's all. Yeah, yeah the, the books are the books are good. She means yeah, yeah. The books the book was better. That's the, our final final thought. Yes, the book was better, much better, much better. <laughs> uh, all right, great. So we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Rajan Khanna, and Maya Prahovnik. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always good to be here. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Rajan Khanna, and Maya Prahovnik for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to E.C. Myers and Noella Handley, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution... You can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.